What do you have to experience before you can say, finally, I'm living? What do you think living really is? The only thing that makes sense is what Paul says. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. The more you live for him, the more you realize, I'm so thankful I don't have to know that I'm not in charge, that it's Christ who's leading. I'm so thankful that he's the one that gives joy and peace. Because Jesus is the key to joy. Let me ask you to open your Bibles with me to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. Uh, we'll be taking a short detour to Acts chapter 9. If you want to go ahead and mark that, uh, that may be helpful to you if you're using a, a regular Bible this morning. Uh, despite being written from a Roman prison, Paul's letter to encourage the church at Philippi has been described by scholars as the happiest of all of his writings. It's frequently called the Bible's letter of joy. And here at Coastline, we've we put a tag on it, and you know this tag, and I hope that you'll say it with me. Jesus is the key to our joy. Let's try that one more time. You ready? Jesus is the key to our joy, and he really is. Throughout his writings, Paul uses four prominent illustrations from the world to communicate the truth about the Christian life, about our walk with Jesus. He uses the military. He uses agriculture. He uses architecture. And as we focus in on verses 12 through 16 this morning, you'll see that he uses an athlete. We'll see our, ourselves in a race this morning in our walk with Jesus Christ. So our, our walk in Christ is characterized in a, as a race. And it's really a great illustration when you think about it. There's a starting line to our life in Christ. It's when we get saved. It's when we surrender our lives to Jesus. There's the race itself that's our lives in Christ, where we grow and change and become more like Him. And we'll be talking more about that. And then there's the finish line, the place where we complete the race and we receive the prize. So here's what we're working toward this morning. I'm, I'm kind of going to give you the answer before we get to the question. And I'd encourage you to write this down somewhere. If you take notes or if you don't mind writing in the margin of your Bible, uh, here's a great two words, just two words to write down. And the two words are the prize. Would you say that with me? The prize. That's what you want to write down somewhere this morning. We'll be coming back to that over and over again. And as we'll see in our text, the prize is important because to finish the race, you have to focus on it. To finish the race, you must stay focused on this thing called the prize. Let me pray for us and we'll grab the word together. Father, as we take some time this morning to look at your word together, we would ask that you would speak to us, that your Holy Spirit would be our teacher this morning. Father, that you would limit any distractions, any thoughts, any things that would come our way that would draw our minds away from what you're trying to say to us this morning. We want to get everything we can from this short time in your word, and we want to truly focus on our prize this morning, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. And everyone said, Amen. 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 So Philippians chapter 3, beginning with verse 12. I'm reading from the New Living Translation this morning. I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things, Paul says, or that I have already reached perfection. 
But I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I've not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead, I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. Verse 15, let all who are spiritually mature agree on these things. If you disagree on some point, I believe God will make it plain to you. But we must hold on to the progress that we have already made. As we pick up in verse 12 this morning, it's pretty apparent that we're continuing with a train of thought that began in the previous verses. I mean, in my Bible, if you look at it, there's a, a break and kind of a subheading before, before verse 12. It may be in your Bible as well. Those things, like chapters and verses, weren't in the original letter, of course. They were added later on just for our convenience so we could kind of keep up and have reference points. So to get the context of our text this morning, we need to back up a little bit. We need to look back at a couple of key verses from the beginning of the chapter. And if you were here last week, you're golden because you've already got it. You'll remember Paul started with a strong warning in chapter 3 to the church to watch out for those who claim that salvation could be obtained through circumcision. That was the big issue at that time. And Paul called them dogs and mutilators. I think he probably got their attention pretty easily with those names. Then Paul shared some of his own story. How he too once thought he could obtain God's favor through righteousness and zeal. And let me tell you, Paul demonstrated both of those in the extreme before he met Jesus. But in verse 7, Paul confessed, I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Pastor Neil said it this way last week, Jesus plus anything ruins everything. And it does. Jesus has already done everything that's needed for our salvation. So now, solely based on His actions, we have a right standing with God, simply by believing in what Jesus has done. And we call that faith. And that's what Paul's saying in verse 9. For God's way of making us right with Himself depends on faith. Then he makes these short statements about his life of faith. And these are super important to our text this morning. It kind of takes us into our text. I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death, so that one way or another, I will experience the resurrection from the dead. And as we pick up today... Paul continued, I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things or that I've already reached perfection, but I press on. So these things that Paul had yet to achieve are listed for us back in verse 10. And we're going to look at those real briefly. Here's kind of a summary of them for you on the screen. First, Paul wants to know Christ. He wants to experience the mighty power found in Jesus. He wants to suffer with Jesus, even share in his death. And maybe it's just me, but as I, as I read through these, it seemed like a very succinct illustration of the race that we all run in Jesus Christ. Now let me see if I can explain that. First, like Paul We want to know Christ, right? That's why we're here this morning. There are lots of other places that we could be on a Sunday morning. And we get to know Christ through the race. 
our life in Christ. I mean, Jesus is right there with us. He's coaching us along through His Word and conversation. Our relationship with Jesus grows in this race. And we mature in knowing Him as we go along. Next, I want to experience the power of Jesus, don't you? Yeah, I want to experience His power in my life. And that happens as we face challenges in the race. As our strength begins to fail, we learn to trust in His mighty power. And we grow in it as His Holy Spirit works in us and through us to accomplish His will. We experience suffering in the race. I mean, some of you are here this morning. You're in the race, but you're suffering in it. You're going through a difficult time, a trial, a great loss, even maybe a a personal or a spiritual attack. And we do. We go through those times in the race. But through the changes and the growth that are produced by them, we start to look more and more like Jesus, our Savior. And yes, we even kind of share in Christ's death in the race. I've heard it said for a relationship to be successful, then someone has to die. We have to die to ourselves. And that's what we do in Christ. We die to ourselves, and then daily we take up our cross and we follow Jesus. Have we finished the race? No. No, we're still in the race. Have we attained perfection, Paul says? Anyone? (laughs) No. No, we're not even close to that. Just like Paul as he penned this letter, we're not there yet. But hey, we're still in the race. And that's why this section of Scripture is so important. And listen, sometimes the the race is amazing. I mean, Jesus' presence is so obvious. Things are great. And we go along like we don't have a care in the world. Then it hits us. A trial comes. We experience suffering in the race. And my first question is always the same. What happened to Jesus? I mean, he was right there beside me. And all of a sudden we lose sight of him and we immediately get consumed by the cares and the worries of this life. This is the working out of our salvation that we talked about in Philippians 2. And let me tell you, it's hard work, this life in Christ. And at this point, some of you may be saying, well, Gosh, Joe, I thought this was going to be an encouraging message. I mean, it's Philippians. It's supposed to be joy-filled, trials, suffering, work. Where's the encouragement in that? Well, I hope you wrote it down when I ask you to. What are we racing toward? The prize. That's what we're racing toward. Like Paul, we're not there yet. But through this race, our life in Christ, we're becoming more and more like Jesus. We've got a clear direction, and we're headed toward what Paul described with the word perfection. Perfection. Now, in Bible terminology, perfection is defined as the quality of being perfect or complete. It's the highest attainable state or degree of excellence that's available to us. The highest. And it's expressed in three different ways here in chapter 3. First, as the resurrection from the dead. That's perfection. That's back in verse 11 from last week. Next, as perfection or completion. Here in verse 12. And then in verse 14, as the heavenly prize. The prize at the end of our race. Remember, to finish the race, we have to stay focused 
on that prize. And here's how we get there. Paul says, but I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. And it's a, it's a small sentence, but it's got a lot packed into it. Two very important phrases, if you're with me in verse 12. The first is press on. And it means to pursue in an aggressive or even a hostile manner. It's the difference between a police officer cruising around your neighborhood, waving and smiling at everyone, and that same police officer running through your neighborhood as fast as he can, trying to catch someone that's knocked off Navy Federal. It's a big difference there. He's not smiling and waving anymore. He's in hot pursuit. And listen, that's the phrase, press on. Hot pursuit. We haven't reached perfection, but Paul says we should be in hot pursuit of that perfection. And the second phrase is to process. Another translation says to lay hold of. And this to process or lay hold of is really an intense word that means to apprehend or to seize something after you've pursued it. You've been chasing it down. And it's the same word used in Mark chapter 9 when a demon seized a little boy and threw him to the ground. So when you take those phrases, press on and lay hold of, and you put them together, it makes a singular thought of chasing down to subdue something. In football, it's a defensive back. He's chasing down a receiver, and when he grabs him, he doesn't lay him down on the ground. He throws him to the ground. So Paul, as he is encouraging the believers in Philippi, he's also encouraging you and I today in our race to pursue and to take down aggressively everything that God has for us, both in this life and in the future. But there's one more thing I think Paul is calling our attention to here. Listen one more time. I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. And here's what I think Paul is saying. In the same intensive and aggressive language that he used before, We're being encouraged to possess perfection. Jesus Christ first had to possess us. Do you see that? It's the beginning of our life in Christ. Paul is making reference to the beginning of this race, our life in Christ. He's saying for us to even be in the race, We had to first be chased down and possessed by Jesus Christ. And listen, Paul is not just repeating what he's heard somewhere. He hasn't got out a a commentary and saying, well, this is what so-and-so said. No, he's sharing his personal testimony of Jesus Christ. And that's why I wanted to run back for just a few minutes to Acts chapter 9. So if you've marked that, or if you're on a digital device, if you'll flip back, Acts chapter 9. Here's the story of how Paul met Jesus from Acts chapter 9 beginning in verse 1. Meanwhile, it says, Saul was uttering threats with every breath, and he was eager to kill the Lord's followers. So he went to the high priest. He requested letters addressed to the synagogues in Damascus, asking for their cooperation in the arrest of any followers of the way he found there. He wanted to bring them, both men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. As he was approaching Damascus on this mission, a light from heaven suddenly shone around him. He fell to the ground. And he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. 
And the voice replied, I'm Jesus. I'm the one you're persecuting. Now get up and go into the city and you'll be told what you must do. The men with Saul stood speechless, for they heard the sound of someone's voice, but they saw no one. Saul, I love this, picked himself up off the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he was blind. So his companions led him by the hand into Damascus. Quite a different arrival than Saul had planned. Saul meets Jesus while he's on a mission to persecute Christians in Damascus. These are followers of Jesus in the early church. And it's not a pleasant introduction. There's a bright light. Saul fell to the ground. And Jesus calls him by name. Does that sound familiar at all? Man, it's aggressive. Back in Philippians chapter 3, that's the intensity, that's the aggression that Paul describes at the beginning of his race. That's how Jesus possessed him, or took him down, if you will. See, Jesus knew Paul wouldn't have responded to anything less than that. Now, is that the way Jesus calls everyone? No, I don't believe it is. Some he calls softly and tenderly, as the old hymn goes. I don't know why, but when I read that, this hymn came back to me. Here's the other side of the coin, if you will, from a beautiful hymn written in the mid-1800s. It says, softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. See, on the portals, he's waiting and watching, watching for you. And for me, come home, come home. Ye who are weary, come home. Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling. Calling for you and for me. I mean, what a contradiction in the two ways that we can be called or pursued or taken down by Jesus Christ. But here's the thing. Jesus knows just what's needed to get our attention. I was a hard case. Jesus had to chase me down and tackle me. That's the way He did it in my life. But it's not so much how Jesus calls. It could be a bright light and blindness, or it could be softly and tenderly. But the really important thing is this. It's how we respond to Jesus. And we all have to respond. Paul responded in a simple statement of surrender. Lord, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? And his race began at that point. Paul reminds us again in verse 13 that he hasn't arrived yet. He says, no, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it. But I focus on this one thing. Would you say one thing? One thing. And then look back with me to what you wrote down earlier. Do you remember that? That thing called the prize? Yeah. And here's that single-mindedness that we've been talking about. Having a single mind that's focused. Verse 13. I focus on this one thing. Forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead, I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God through Christ Jesus is calling us. I love that Paul says one thing and then he gives us two things. I think that's kind of comical. But what he's doing here is perfect for people like me. See, at this point, I'm, I'm saying, okay, Paul, I get what you're saying. I get what you're telling me. Just tell me what to do. That's the kind of guy I am. I want to know what to do. And he does that. Paul is giving us a method here to have this single mind that leads to the prize and that also leads to that joy that comes with the prize. 
First, to have this singular focus, this single-mindedness, requires that we forget about the past. And I love what Bible commentator Warren Wearsby says about this word, forget. We're going to put it on the screen for you. He says, to forget in the Bible means no longer to be influenced by or affected by. Their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. He, he's not suggesting that he will conveniently have a bad memory. This is impossible with God. What God is saying is that I will no longer hold their sins against them. Their sins can no longer affect their standing with me or influence my attitude for them. Oh, I love that so much. So forgetting those things which are behind does not suggest an impossible feat of mental or psychological gymnastics by which we try to erase our sins or mistakes of the past. It simply means that we break the power of the past by living in the future. Man, I think Warren Wearsby got a hold of that scripture. That said, I know how easy it is to get hung up in the past. There are a lot of things to pull us back there. There are the victories from our glory days. The educational and business accomplishments that we can be so proud of. The trophy on the shelf or the plaque on the wall or more recently the memory that will pop up on social media. Things that we cherish and want to remember. But Paul set the standard for us back in verse 7 when he said, he considered them worthless. And that word worthless means of no value whatsoever because of what Jesus Christ has done. And then there are the memories we, we'd really like to forget. The remnants of better defeats. The failures that we gladly put away from us. Things that we've done and said and wish we could take back. Those vivid pictures that the enemy brings to our memory all too often of the person that we used to be. The person we were before Christ. And listen, nothing kills our joy more than living in the past. Nothing. Paul says forget those things. See, Paul was using his spiritual mind he was looking at the things on earth from God's perspective. And as a result, he wasn't upset by things behind him, around him, or before him. Things didn't rob him of his joy because he was focused. He had this spiritual mindset. He had a godly perspective as he looked at things. And it's a challenge for us. It's a choice, I think, that we make, refusing to allow our past successes to inflate our pride, our past failures to defeat our self-worth. We live in the present. It's our identity in Christ that we live in. We're forgiven. We're free. We have a family of believers around us to go through this life with. And we have a future in Jesus Christ. See, we choose to leave the past behind to embrace the present and to focus on the prize. And that's part two of Paul's method for bringing our minds into a singular focus. Looking forward to what lies ahead, he says. The prize. Life with our Savior forever. I love what Pastor Neil says. He says, it's all, always, and only about Jesus. See, Jesus is our prize. He is. You can call it what you want to. The end of the race, the heavenly prize, perfection, resurrection from the dead, the finish line. All of these things are expressions of being in the presence of Jesus forever. And that's what we're racing toward. 
And you may say, oh, is, that, is that it, Joe? Is that, that all there is waiting for us out there? Oh, no. <laughs> There's much more than that. You might want to jot these down as we go through them pretty quickly. 1 Corinthians 2.9 says this, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love Him. 2 Corinthians 5.1 For we know that when this earthly tent we live in is taken down, we'll have a house in heaven, an eternal body, made for us by God Himself and not by human hands. See, there's so much more. In John 14, verses 2 and 3, there's more than enough room in my Father's home. If this were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am, Jesus said. Revelation 21.4, He'll wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there will be no more death, or sorrow, or crying, or pain. All these things will be gone forever. And we could literally go on forever. There's so much more out there for us. Lots of different reasons to finish the race well. But here's the absolute truth. All these things are there only because Jesus is there. Did you know that? That's why heaven is heaven. Heaven's not just a standalone place. Heaven is heaven because Jesus is sitting right in the middle of it. He's the prize and He's the key to our joy. So together, Paul says, let's press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. And we're going to finish up this morning with just a couple of verses, verses 15 and 16. And the reason we're going there is it's a much-needed call for Christian unity in the church, both in Paul's time and in our time today. See, the prize means joy. But I think if we stay focused on the prize, if we have that singular focus, what it means for us in the church is unity in the church. So Paul said this, let all who are spiritually mature Agree on these things. If you disagree at some point, I believe God will make it plain to you. But we must hold on to the progress that we have already made. That hold on is from our men's retreat, if you were there, hold fast. Hang on to with all that you've got. And you may ask, what are we agreeing on? What are those things that bring unity and joy in the church. In verse 1 of chapter 3, Paul said this, Whatever happens, my dear brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. We need to agree to be joyful in any circumstance that comes our way. Because here's the thing, joy safeguards our faith. It really does. Salvation is through Christ alone. We need to agree together that yes, everything else is worthless when you compare it to the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, our Lord. Nothing else compares to Jesus. And let's agree to stay focused. There's a prize waiting for us. It's a great prize. It's Jesus Christ. He's going to meet us there, and He's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. And I don't understand this, but the Bible says when we see Him, we'll be like Him. It's a great promise. He's with us through this race we call life. And then He'll be there with us 
as we cross that finish line, as we take the prize. And finally, press on. Press on. I want to encourage you this morning. Press on in the race that you're in. And nobody knows that race like you do. Your race is different from everybody else's race. But you're here this morning. I know that you're here because you're in this race. You're following Jesus Christ. And you're making great progress in that. Don't let the enemy distract you or rip you off or steal any of the progress you've made. I think what Paul is saying, what I would encourage you with this morning is this. Hey, press on. Stay in the race. There's a prize waiting for you. And his name is Jesus.